Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight for our free webinar, Let's Treat the IT Band, featuring Whitfield Reeves. My name is Jeff Bloom, Education Marketing Manager here at LASA OMS. For over 40 years, LASA OMS has been striving to promote the growth of the acupuncture industry by providing quality products, great prices, and the best customer service, as well as supporting the many schools and continuing education efforts available. With our free webinar series, we intend to provide free educational opportunities taught by some of the industry's most renowned practitioners and educators. I would like to take a moment to acclimate you to the webinar room. We recommend viewing the webinar in Chrome, Firefox, or Safari as you can experience this in other browsers. And to the right of the video screen, you will see three tabs, chat, questions, and polls. To chat with other attendees or to communicate any technical difficulties, please use the chat tab. For questions for WIT, please use the questions tab to assure that we see them at the end of the lecture. Please note that each webinar is recorded and immediately following the conclusion, you will receive an email with a link to view the video on demand. You may always visit our blog and use the free webinar tag to find all of our previously recorded events. For its acupuncture to Chinese herbs to practice management, you'll find something interesting for every practitioner on the LASA OMS blog. And I would also like to mention a few new great features at LASA OMS. We have just launched our new LASA Direct dispensary program to allow practitioners to recommend products to patients and receive a commission on those purchases. We will share a link in the chat to our blog to learn more on how to access this program using your LASA OMS account. We also now have the ability to receive text alerts about inventory updates and other important details. If you text the word supply, S-U-P-P-L-Y, to the number 855-358-3253, and you'll be on that list. Carl will put this into the chat for you right now. Now for our featured speaker. We are proud to introduce Whitfield Reeves. Whit has been working in the field of sports medicine since he first began practice in 1981. He earned a doctorate of oriental medicine degree in 1983 that included a thesis entitled Acupuncture and the Treatment of Common Running Injuries. His experience in sports medicine included the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic Games, as well as numerous track and field, ski racing, and cycling events nationally over the last 30 plus years. He has been in the forefront of acupuncture sports medicine field, emphasizing the integration of acupuncture with orthopedics and anatomy. Whitfield is the author of the Acupuncture Handbook of Sports Injuries and Pain. His popular acupuncture sports medicine apprenticeship program uses a small group mentor mentorship style setting in the instruction of orthopedic style acupuncture. He does have some updates for live stream courses, so please check your email five minutes after the webinar for information on that. Please join me in welcoming Whitfield Reeves. Hello, y'all. I see your names, Marianne and uh, Bison uh, oh, in Colorado. Hello, y'all. Um, your names are flying by here, but I got to pay attention. So uh, welcome. It's, uh, it's amazing that we uh, have uh, so much time that, that hundreds of us can uh, hang out uh, on, you know, on, on a webinar together. And it's incredibly anxiety producing that we have enough time that hundreds of us can hang out in the web room and, and all that. So, you know, this is a two-edged sword. Uh, everything is always yin and yang. And uh, I have loved the clean air and the crisp night skies and, you know, just the quiet of people not running around so much. And yet uh, we've, uh, you know, there's a lot of anxiety for all of us of, of our health and finances and, all of this. So uh, we need to just stay together and we need to, to, to uh, realize that we're all interrelated. I, I, I don't think that whole idea that we are one, I, you know, I've said that since I was 18 in 1969. And I maybe understand now, maybe I understand it now. So here we are. And, uh, we'll get from philosophical to really practical here real quick. Um, treating the iliotibial band. Um, uh, you see my website there. You can always email me. I actually meant to have my email address on there. Uh, 
but you email me with questions. You can email me from my website and my website has all kinds of stuff on it. Um, so we need to um, look at my beautiful little uh, photo right along a beach walk uh, in the central coast of California of some nice uh, blooming purple flowers. Uh, and so our topic, sitting too much, is my assumption that we all are at home and we're doing more sitting than we've done. And a tight IT band uh, is one of the um, uh, results of that. And the topic and the, the subject and details of this are going to wander around in some fashion that may not be very linear and may not even uh, in the end answer the question that we think that we're posing, which is, can we treat the iliotibial band and do a good job? So, but let us continue. Um, I, I like starting with uh, a translation um, from the Huang Di Nei Ching, uh, just so that we understand that we're not renegade freaks, those of us who like um, uh, orthopedic acupuncture, sports acupuncture, anatomically based acupuncture, all of these different kind of veins of practice that unite us together. Um, and we're still very much part of Chinese medicine. And while some people want to look at us as outsiders, um, we must not allow that to happen, and we must uh, understand and stand for the fact that we uh, are using the deepest aspects of Chinese medicine uh, as we treat orthopedic and uh, anatomical problems. So, but of the five failings uh, that's discussed in Huang Di Nei Ching, the third failing occurs when the physician lacks deductive reasoning. Much information about a patient's condition is gathered in addition to careful observation of the body signs and the inquiry of the patient's symptoms. After gathering the pieces of information, a physician's task to utilize his or her knowledge and analyze through deduction the entire picture of the patient's illness. Inability to do this limits the physician's effectiveness. Uh, this particular of the five failings, they're all wonderful. They all have something interesting in it. But sometimes some of us feel like, uh, like an analysis, analytical thinking, deductive reasoning, you know, is not intuitive and is, doesn't fit into the more metaphoric aspect of Chinese medicine. And here we are right from our classics. Uh, suggesting that deductive reasoning is hugely important for us. So especially if you're doing telemedicine, uh, you're going to have to think things out because you don't have much touching and smelling and feeling uh, and all the kinesthetic pieces that are missing if you're uh, treating some of your patients, you know, online. So at any rate, so there's the problem right there. The problem is somewhere like if you get a movie in 1951, this is how people look up. Now, my cursor doesn't work on this platform. Okay, so I might as well not try to use it. So the, um, the, the banding person in the middle is erect and has this incredible posture. And lo and behold, between then, say 50 years ago, and now we've come into forward flexion of the hip, forward uh, um, anterior shoulders, forward head position. All of this uh, has been really quite problematic. And so in all the teaching I do, uh, I, I always talk about this because this was not the case when I started practice in 1981. And, and so a lot of the things I say now, I had not a clue in 1981. So it's always adjusting to the body and how the body is changing uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and so in this COVID era, more of us are sitting, more of us are on computers, and we're going to focus today on... Um, 
on forward flexion and, and the seated posture of, of, of the lumbar spine. And probably what that does to L4, L5, L5, S1, what that does to one of most important muscles, which is the, um, uh, the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. Now, I gave a talk really about the triad approach to the low back, uh, focusing on the gluteus medius and minimus, the quadratus lumborum and the sacral iliac joint. With, uh, with long mess, we, did, uh, we, we covered the sacral iliac joint. We talked about the gluteus medius. So where we're going here is that the gluteus medius is hugely important. So if we go kind of go back up here to the iliotibial band, the gluteus medius is right up there in the iliac fossa. And so the iliotibial band, the origin of the iliotibial band is fascially the gluteus maximus, the big muscle in the back, the gluteus medius, that pie-shaped muscle right in the middle, and the tensor fasciolata, the anterior muscle that, that looks like that's a straight connection down to the iliotibial band. But the fascia of those three muscles functionally create the origin of the iliotibial band. Now that's important. The iliotibial band, of course, is important because we see people with foam rollers all the time rolling their IT bands because they're tight. But we're going to talk about all that. So uh, the gluteus medius, uh, Janet Travell and her work on trigger points called the gluteus medius the lumbago muscle. So, so right, it refers paid into the lumbosacral region. Uh, it's also a very important pelvic and lumbosacral stabilizer. Uh, it's a lot the Xiaoyang gallbladder channel, but the gluteus medius often is involved and results in pain and tightness along the IT track. So we cannot think about trying to fix the iliotibial band without thinking about the gluteus medius. So let us continue. In this illustration, see up, up in the iliac fossa, you see the gluteus medius marked, the gluteus maximus marked, the tensor fasciolata marked, all of those being the origin of the IT band. And then the IT band just running down the leg, as we know, along that gallbladder channel, all the way down uh, past the knee, past gallbladder 34, and attaching onto the tibia, iliotibial. It starts in the ilium and it attaches in on the tibia, not on the fibula, as you would think, but on the tibia. So a big, long muscle, it's got a lot of functions. We can't really spend too much time uh, on that. But, but here we see a picture of the gluteus medius from the side. And when you look at that and you start getting your little sticky uh, circles to, to mark acupuncture points, there's no acupuncture point there. Bladder 54, bladder 53 is back towards the sacrum. Gallbladder 29 is around the front, more anterior. Gallbladder 30 is more inferior. There are no acupuncture points on this muscle, and this being a very, very important muscle in this era. There are trigger points and motor points in the gluteus medius, and with the gluteus medius cut away, there's the gluteus minimus, a second muscle. So they're like two muscles like pancakes sitting on top of each other, basically orig originating in the iliac fossa and attaching down towards the greater trochanter. So here we're looking at the gluteus minimus with the gluteus medius cut away. We um, look at this, and this is really the most important thing I want to emphasize today. The gluteus medius, if you look on the right illustration, the gluteus medius shown on that right illustration is weak. It's not activated. It's not working. And when you stand on that leg, the pelvis drops on the opposite side, which is called a Trendelenburg gait or a Trendelenburg posture. On the left, we have a strong activated gluteus medius. And on single leg standing, the pelvis stays 
level. Now, all you have to do is look on the right illustration at the lower lumbar spine and go, oh boy, that can't be good. You can look at the sacral iliac joint. Oh, boy, that can't be good. You can even look at the hip joint and kind of go, man, that, that kind of torsion and that, that tilt cannot be good for those structures. And so we have a problem and the problem is the gluteus medius is called is a phasic muscle this is a muscle of activity rather than a postural muscle which shortens tightens and kind of holds us up against gravity phasic muscles inhibit or or get turned off very very easily is the body's way of saving this muscle because these are the muscles that take us out to find food find shelter you know uh, you know, keep the enemy out of our out of our territory. Very, very primitive genetic encoding that that these phasic muscles have. So the gluteus medius doesn't like sitting. And now, as I say this, I don't know that it's true, but this is what I think. I don't have any data that tells me really what what is, you know accurate but i think that prolonged sitting especially in cars sitting in cars uh inhibits the gluteus medius it doesn't like sitting and it could be from the spinal nerve roots it could be from uh, other sitting uh postures of positions it may be something else that happens when we're sitting that we don't even understand yet but I don't think anybody's got it out of why the gluteus medius gets inhibited. And it just, here's a big, strong muscle that just kind of is inactive. It's just not working right. So you imagine the iliotibial band that runs down on this right illustration that runs down that lateral leg. You have this Trendelenburg posture. You've got all this torsion going on. And you kind of go, wow, okay, that's going to really contribute to, to a tight iliotibial band. So this is the first place we need to look at uh, uh, in, in thinking and diagnosing an IT band. So here we see the gluteus medius out of way. There's the gluteus minimus, the deeper muscle. There's the gluteus minimus. Now, this is interesting because in the... In, in the trim point world, both the gluteus medius and minimus, remember they're sitting on top of each other. They refer pain in all of those red dotted areas. You see a lot of Tai Yang pain coming from a, a gallbladder area, you know, muscle. You see a sacral radiation here in the third one over coming uh coming from a gallbladder channel area of stagnation and then you see on the fourth one from the left you see radiation going to the bladder channel or the s1 zone and on the fifth one you see radiation going down the iliotibial band so the subject being the iliotibial band we always need to to leave in our mind the possibility that maybe the gluteus minimus the muscle deep to the gluteus medius could be responsible for referring pain down the IT band. Now, stiffness and tightness, mm, probably not so, but it's a it's good to keep uh, to keep a you know an image of this clear. Uh, and so we're going to start this with the extraordinary point gin, which translates as strength and thigh. And Jin Kwa is located halfway from the greater trochanter to the iliac crest, right on the posterior side of the tensor fasciolata. You see it placed there. Remember the gallbladder 29 is located halfway from the greater trochanter to the anterior superior iliac spine. And you see gallbladder 29 placed here more anteriorly, but clearly off the gluteus medius. So in that pie-shaped, pure Shaoyang portion of the body, just look at the IT band and follow it straight up. And there is the extraordinary point, Jin Kwa. Did not exist 
when the bronze statue in 1072 was made, when the compendium of the bronze statue was was put was was completed, it just didn't exist because people weren't sitting. Perhaps lots of reasons, lots of speculation. I think most speculation is probably pretty good, but this is our point that we're going to use in in treatment of the tight iliotibia band. It'll be our first place we go. Here you see the greater trochanter labeled. You see that that edge of the gluteus maximus and that triangle shape zone is the uh, is the gluteus medius, and you can see how how you go posterior to the tensor fasciolata, the red muscle there, uh, in order to access the gluteus medius. Now, the gluteus medius has lots of territory and lots of areas one could needle, but I'm talking about the, the, the place that is just so incredibly useful, and that is the extraordinary point Genqua. It's the first place I go. I disregard Asher points all over the hip and pelvis and glutes. And I go to Jin Kwa as my first point of entry as I'm trying to treat the gluteus medius in relationship to this IT band. And again, you see the IT band going down the lateral leg along the gallbladder channel. And you can see that from the tensor fasciolata to the fascia over the gluteus medius to the gluteus maximus. Great images and really helpful to understand that origin um, as, as just a very valuable place to work from. So as we uh, continue, um, in treating the gluteus medius and minimus, one of the things we do is we want to activate an inhibited muscle. So we've already stated that the gluteus medius get inhibited maybe by prolonged sitting. As soon as the gluteus medius is inhibited, the pelvis starts moving around and we've got all kinds of problems in the perhaps the SI joint or uh, the piriformis or in this particular case, the iliotibial band. So we're using the, the point GMA to both activate the gluteus medius and to treat the entire iliotibial tract. Extraordinary point Gian Qua in LE55 is the point that you would find it in the Shanghai text. Let me repeat it again. Halfway between the greater trochanter and the iliac crest on the Xiaoyang line, posterior to the ridge of the TFL in a palpable depression, always confirmed with Asher. You don't have to guess here. You will always get Asher. And this is the place to go. I like lateral recumbent, which is sideline prone face down works also, um, but lateral recumbent is particularly nice because you can just see the whole pelvis so clearly. You palpate perpendicularly into, into the, the tissue and you needle perpendicularly into the tissue. So once you, uh, so once you palpated, you just get a needle and it's the same angle. And remember, there's two muscles, so you have to feel that needle penetrate two muscles. And in the end, it might hit bone, which is the iliac fossa, deep to all of this. Uh, I use a 75 millimeter needle, one of my absolute favorites. I buy from yours truly, Lhasa OMS. They do a wonderful job. I love the Seren uh, G-Type uh, 0.25 by 75. It's a three-inch needle. 0.25. I never have a more fatter, larger diameter needle than 0.25 when I use a three inch needle. So it's still really easy to slide through the tissue. I'll often in this treatment of, of, of this point, I will often use two points. Okay. And so let me see what happens here. We'll leave that away. So here again, talking about treating up in the origin to release a tight iliotibial band. So I'm going to hopefully not fail. I'm going to show you a shot of the, uh, of, of, of needling here, the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. So, and I'm going to try to, uh, we don't have a lot of time. So 
I'm going to run this fast, but there you see, uh, uh, there you see the greater trochanter. You see me uh, getting halfway between the, the uh, oh, uh, you don't see my cursor. Okay, I just got to keep this running here. Uh, so you see the, the tensor fasciolata and you roll off the back of the tensor fasciolata and there's the gluteus medius. There's the tensor fasciolata and the IT band going down the leg. So from the ilia on the Xiaoyang line, right between the two, exactly, it's always that way. It's always halfway between the greater trochanter and the iliac crest, right on the Xiaoyang line. And it often is, a, is, is elongated like this, a nice palpable depression. Here you see me rolling off the muscle. Very useful. Use that palpation technique. Don't have the flying finger all by itself. And just feel with multiple fingers, roll off. Now here I found that the tensor fasciolata was a little bit thicker and wider than I had anticipated. And But the point still in the same depression that's very, very clear. Halfway from the greater trochanter to the iliac crest. Sometimes you go from the posterior and move anterior and push up against the tight band. So this is a yin, soft, easy to get to place. You're not needling into a thick, dense uh, zone of muscle. Uh, it's very, very friendly. And uh, let me just see if I can just speed this up a little bit. With all my fussing around, I found in that elongated zone, two really clear places to uh, zones to put needle. Osher was confirmed. Uh, we're in the muscle belly of the gluteus medius. Uh, uh, it's in a depression. Everything is working just fine. And then uh, we, we needle with a three inch needle. We were pal palpating perpendicularly. We needle perpendicularly. Very, very simple. Uh, this, uh, actually, this is not a serin needle I'm using here. So this is a MAC needle. That's another one of my uh, favorites uh, for this particular one. The um, perpendicular needle going straight in so that eventually the, what's going to get in our way is the bony iliac fossa. So there I'm about an inch in, and I'm just going to continue to find a way for the needle to penetrate both must the medius and the minimus. And eventually you might hit bone, and I just felt bone at the at the deepest portion of that. And I just withdraw the needle, retract the needle back a little bit. Um, and this is a very, very typical look of two needles in the muscle belt of the gluteus medius needled through the medius and through the minimus. Uh, so you're really needling both points. And that is just a classic look. Uh, we would consider electric stimulation on this. Uh, we could uh, east him on this. Very, very useful. So I like that very much. So lo, let me see if I can find my way back. Uh, so... Um, um, okay, I found my way back. So you can see from this illustration that needle was up at the origin of this. But, you know, something happened. Actually, hold on. So here, here we've got some points. So we, we do know that we have no acupuncture point up in the gluteus medius, gluteus minimus. There's no basic meridian points. So the first place we get is gallbladder 31, gallbladder 32, gold 33 and what I call an anterior version of gallbladder 33 and then further inferior uh, we get to gallbladder 34. So those are all the points that we know. Uh, but gallbladder 30 is very much posterior. Gallbladder 29 is very much anterior. So we don't have a, a, a meridian point but Jianqua in fact serves that purpose very very well. But 
what happens as we start working our way down the iliotibial band is we bump up against the trochanteric bursa. So remember that the muscle is above the greater trochanter, but sitting on top of the greater trochanter uh, um, is a bursa. And when that bursa is painful to palpation, you have a clue that all of this tight iliotibial band is compressing and rubbing against the bursa and the bursa is getting thickened and inflamed. And your key symptom, I hope you all know this, but some of you might not, the key symptom of trochanteric bursitis is pain on lying on the side. The patient says, I've got hip pain. They don't point to the bursa. It just hurts everywhere or in many different presentations. It's not usually pinpoint. It's not like a, a blood stagnation where they would point to that circle and say, that's where I hurt. Matter of fact, sometimes they're surprised when you palpate it and find it. Kind of go, wow, I didn't know that was there. But yeah, that's it. Lying on the side at night or during rest, they, they can't lie on their side. They got to roll over. They can't lie on the side. That is almost always trochanteric bursitis. And that's going to be one of our first problems that show up with a inhibited pathologic gluteus medius and a tight iliotibial band. So the tighter the iliotibial band, the more probability you've got problems, the trochanteric bursa. So what I'm gonna do here is make things really simple for you. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, I, I've given you two key symptoms. One, pain upon palpation. So, so you palpate the affected side and it's very painful, and the opposite side is not painful. So pain, osher pain on palpation at the greater trochanter, and pain lying on the affected side. Those two signs or symptoms almost always will lead you to trochanteric bursitis and saves you a lot of headache thinking, gosh, do they have joint arthritis or, you know, a labral tear or something like that, because they all act the same. The hip all becomes tightened and contracted, overreacting, trying to hold all this stuff together, overcompensating. And, and so the pain and the assure will be spread throughout lumbosacral gluteal region. So you, you just never know for sure. But here, we've already seen those two points in the gluteus medius. There, that X is our friendly uh, uh, zone of the, of the uh, trochanteric bursa. And here we just have the simplest, simplest treatment, which is surround the dragon. So here we're doing slightly transverse, uh, transverse to slightly oblique needles, north, south, east, west, or if you wish, posterior, anterior, superior, inferior. So surrounding the dragon, uh, needling into the zone of the uh, bursa of the trochanter, the greater trochanter. With electric stimulation on, on those needles, even five to 10 minutes of e-stim rotated around would uh, be very useful. Let me just see if I can uh, get back to for one second here. Um, let me just see if I can hold that right there before it stops. So there we see surround the dragon. And rather than surround the dragon being this sort of prayer of, oh, it hurts here and I'm going to throw needles in and hope it works, you know that you've got a bursa in there and your needles are going to go up against the bursa, maybe penetrate the bursa whatever they're 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 either exactly going into the area of stagnation of chi blood and fluids or really close and with east directing current into the bursa really really effective treatment generally speaking and an orthopedist will tell you on a trochanteric bursitis without all the complications one injection of steroid will usually suffice 
uh, one injection uh, uh, a case of trochanteric bursitis. So if, if you can inject steroid into this, my gosh, we should be able to needle and e-stem and use the meridians and release the muscles, all the care that we do to this. Uh, it, it should be almost uh, as effective and maybe even more effective in clinical experience. Tell this is a great treatment. It works very well. You should have very little uh, problems with this. Now understand some people are really bony and you have to be transverse. Other people have got a lot of tissue on there, plus there might even be a boggy, damp bursa. You, those people, you might be able to needle pendicularly because you have enough tissue to get into. Whereas the bony person, you have two or three millimeters and you hit bone. So let the anatomy tell you how to get the needle in there and view the needle as a mechanical stimulation as well as electric um, as well as the introduction electric current, if you're using e-stem, which I, I just think you have to use e-stem. You've got to use e-stem. It's just so effective. So back here now, we have uh, um, we have found the first thing bumping in our way. You know, as we go down the IT band, if that's happening, we got to clean that because that IT band is going to stay tight, and you may never have known that bursa was inflamed. So as we go down, uh, uh, oh yeah, here's the bursa again. Uh, and here you see the IT band on this illustration. Up top, you see the IT band rubbing across the greater trochanter, as we've just discussed. But as we take the IT band all the way down, the next point of difficulty is the lateral knee and the lateral epicondyle of the knee. So if we've got a tight IT band, now we have the possibility that this band is rubbing across the lateral bony surface above the joint space of the lateral knee. And in fact, this is called iliotibial band syndrome, which is a form of lateral knee pain. And it, all it is is the undersurface of the iliotibial band is rubbing on the bone and it hurts. And runs will get it because it's called runner's knee. And so they have to get it by the name. No, you understand. So uh, very, very typical with a tight eye band to also have the presentation of runner's knee. Could even have clicking and popping and snapping as in a bad case where the band is, is going over the lateral epicondyle, even up at the hip, the fascia could be rolling over the, the greater trochanter and the bursa, and you could be having popping and snapping and crepitus, all symptoms or signs of wind, right? Sudden onset, sudden appearance, movable, changeable, sudden onset, sudden disappearance. And Lo and behold, we've got our friendly point, gallbladder 31, right in the middle of it all, but we're not going to do that yet. Let's keep going. So iliotibial band, band syndrome is lateral knee. It's, uh, it's on the undersurface of the IT band. You can clearly see on this left illustration how the bone is there, and it's protruding out against the band and with 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 a certain type of biomechanical movements like running and especially sprinting and hills and exaggerated uh, knee flexion and extension, this can become a problem. This too is an easy condition to treat. It's, it's diagnosable so easy by the signs and the symptoms, palpating the area and it's point sensitive with tightness in the iliotibial band and you go back up to the gluteus medius and I've never seen a case of iliotibial band syndrome or runner's knee that did not have Asher at Gianqua, at the extraordinary point Gianqua. That's how I've, that's how I found it, you know, is that it just kept being there and I had to figure out, well, what is this? Okay, so here we go. So now we've got this but from the so we go down now to to this area of pain uh, right before the attachment to the tibia.
And this too is a very, very easy place to treat because we can thread needles under the iliotibial tract. So here's a case of, of using threading the tendon or threading, uh, threading a muscle or threading a tendon technique. And these needles come from anterior and posterior sides on the deep side of the pain. The X marks where the pain is, but the pain's on the undersurface. And so we put needles in, un, uh, tore in the region of the undersurface, run an electrical current in there, that stimulation gets in there, activates the chi and blood, cools, uh, cools the heat. It just does a wonderful job. And iliotibial band syndrome is very, very easy to treat by this low treatment and of course going up to the gluteus medius and needling at the extraordinary point gin qua so let me see what i got next here yeah we'll save that so let's uh let's take a look a quick look at uh needling uh the it band um and here we see uh i hope this is it so here we see uh, the IT band. It's clearly marked. We've got a posterior border. We've got an anterior border. Uh, gallbladder 33 is on the posterior border. And you can see uh, further around uh, that little brown line there. That's the, bicep, uh, the lateral hamstring tendon, the biceps tendon. The little, um, so anyway, so here we uh, are trying to uh, outline the iliotibial tract and we're going to use uh, uh, 18 these are actually 20 by 40 so inch and a half knees and we're going to thread them under the iliotibial tract and we're going to put a couple of we're going to put two pairs of needles threaded under the iliotibial tract so it's pretty simple um, and you can have a nice space on the posterior side because there's a lot of empty space. The anterior side is up against the uh, the quadricep, the vastus lateralis. So sometimes that's a little bit more difficult to get the needle, you know, through a little bit of the quad to slide in that space under the tendon. So there we have a threading under the iliotibial tract anteriorly. And we'll put a second one in there because it will increase the likelihood that both mechanically we're going to be opening up tissue. And then as we introduce E-STEM, that current is going to uh, help to activate chi and blood and take out the inflammation and what have you. So a very good local treatment uh, from the posterior side, which is usually much easier, we, we, we introduce the, a needle and we needle in an anterior direction. And, uh, and that's usually a little simpler because you can see that there's more space there. It's just a little bit simpler. So there's two needles uh, going anteriorly from the side. So it's very, very simple. From the posterior side, the anterior side, we've got two simple uh, ways uh, to what am I doing? What am I doing? Come on, show me what I got here. There we go. Um, we've got two very simple techniques to uh, to assure us that we can slide a needle under under the iliotibial band. Now, this is for treating runner's knee. This is the patient has lateral knee pain. It might snap and pop after three miles of running. It hurts, but it doesn't hurt once they get home and they're resting. It hurts when they're moving and when the band is rubbing across the bone. So uh, this, is, this is a great treatment, but our topic is not really iliotibial band syndrome. Our topic is tightness of the iliotibial band. This is a wonderful treatment to add to a treatment for tightness of the iliotibial band. I think probably because of the proprioceptive fibers, the afferent fibers, the, the nerve fibers 
at that tenderness area going up to the brain. When we, uh, when we needle, uh, um, when we needle into areas of proprioception and afro fibers, something happens neurologically. And so, um, um, so what have you? So I'm, I'm seeing somebody saying that they didn't see the slide, the, the, the video. Yeah. Um, and maybe, uh, um, if I can show that again, if, if that, in fact is the case. So anyway, there we have this. What I'm suggesting is threading the iliotibial tract as if you were treating runner's knee, but the iliotibial band is tight. It hasn't quite started to hurt there. It hadn't quite started to snap and pop, but it's going to eventually. Um, this is a treatment, and this will, with the rest of the needles, starting with the needling up into the muscle belly as we started, uh, this is going to help with the iliotibial band. So it's a nice adjunct to this. So we continue. Um, and again, we, uh, we got to remind ourselves that this is happening and this, uh, uh, the iliotibial band and the gluteus medius, the pelvis pays a price for this, but let me see what I've got here. So, so in the process here, I use four steps, and I don't think that um, I don't think that I need to go into too much detail of this. Those of you who are interested, you can you can follow this uh, in my book, uh, my book, the Acupuncture Handbook of Sports Injuries and Pain. Um, uh, but if we were to use this approach in the treatment of iliotibial band syndrome, we would certainly want to start at the beginning, which is treating the tendinomuscle meridian. And the tendinomuscle meridian, it, you know, its end point is the Jingwell point. So we have a Xiaoyang diagnosis. We've got gallbladder 44. We can take 10 drops of blood out of uh, gallbladder 44 as a starting point to, to release tension along the iliotibial tract, even up into the gluteus medius. Uh, and this is a great place to start. When we go to step two, we've got different meridians and microsystems. One of the systems that I like very much is the shoestream point combination. And in this situation, we have a shallow diagnosis that either has its origin up in the hip or has its origin at the knee. But either way, as we go distal, we want to go distal to the shoe stream point. The shoe stream point is gallbladder 41, unless it isn't. And unless our great masters partied the night before they were doing the, the compendium of the bronze statue and they woke up a little hungover on rice wine and they didn't understand where they left off and they left off at gold bladder 42. Gosh, they were almost done. They'd been doing this for, for like three quarters of a decade. They were almost done and they forgot gold bladder 42. So they went to gold bladder 41 and said, yes, this is the master point of the daimai. And Yes, this must be the shoe stream point also. If you go one point distal, if you go down to gallbladder 42, there's nothing there. Every other case is the first point is the Jingwell point. The second point is the Ying stream. The third point is the shoe stream. We know the shoe stream points are very, very important in treating neck pain for small intestine three tooth pain for large intestine three, uh, ear pain, headache, you know, uh, Xiaoyang headache for Sanjiao three, et cetera, et cetera. At least palpate and consider gallbladder 42 as the shoe stream point. Palpate, see what's sensitive. This is a trick that maybe will help you sometime get a point that works just a little bit better. Uh, it, then when we coupled with Sanjiao 3, the Shu stream point Xiaoyang on the opposite side, upper lower. So we have 
Gold bladder 42 on the affected side, distal to the to the lesions up along the iliotibial band, Sanjiao 3 on the opposite side. Uh, and so often you can needle those as a combination to activate upper, lower, right, left, and move the Xiaoyang channel. It can work very, very well. So that may be a shoestring point combination. Of course, we're going to think of the other traditional point categories that would include gallbladder 34. You all know that you all are going to be looking at that. But also remember, let's go back to this guy. Remember, the possibility exists that in that last illustration, the male or the female sitting at that desk, look at the dimai, look at the constriction of the dimai vessel around the waist. Maybe, just maybe, this is a dimai problem. And so we could use gallbladder for one and, and couple it with the Sanjiao 5, master point, couple point. That would be using technique seven on this list, uh, um, the extraordinary meridians. Step three would tell us, do we have an internal organ imbalance or something like that going on? And one of the things, a quick story, we don't have too much time, but I had a period of time in, uh, in the years I was in Boulder, Colorado. I was there 25 years and treated lots of athletes. And, and uh, after the Olympics, I eventually got myself to Boulder and had a wonderful time. And we raised our son there. And... and uh, our son happened to be at our house when sheltering in place happened. So he's with us now. So, and he hopes to leave soon. Living with mom and dad is not the greatest thing, but we're actually having a great time together. So the, uh, the, um, this, there was this period of time where I had like five or six, seven, a bunch of iliotibial band cases in runners. And they had snapping, popping, you know, the, 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 the iliotibial tract was just violently just popping over the, the, the knee and the lateral knee and what have you. And I, I uh, ended up finding out that each one of them were, not only were they attorneys, they were prosecuting attorneys. And so they had a lot of gall. They spent their work life making plans and strategies and with lots of gall executing those plans and strategies. And here came to life this condition that I thought was other cause disease, accident trauma. And it well may have been accident and trauma, but with a little bit of susceptibility to the gallbladder champ, which was over tight from over galling, right? Over livering, over planning, you know, over strategizing. And uh, I mean, these weren't people working for nonprofits, helping people in Africa, you know, these were prosecuting attorneys. That was really interesting to me. So every now and then I get an iliotibial band or a tight IT band patient, uh, and uh, I kind of uh, I kind of look at what they're doing, and I kind of sometimes we'll see that liver involvement uh, in terms of the classic functions of the liver makes the plans, and the gallbladder executes those plans and strategies. So, at any rate, and then of course step four, the site of the injury, we've already covered this with needling into the gluteus medius, or and or needling into uh, the uh, threading the tendon. And the only thing that I didn't really cover, let me see if I've got another, um, um, yeah, let's save that. Uh, let, uh, what I didn't cover is uh, gallbladder 31. And, and, I, and over, the, over time, I have really come to, um, uh, to really appreciate gallbladder 31 in ways that I never did you know, before, but uh, I was meeting with an acupuncturist oh, about six months ago. 
uh, in Oakland, Frank Chung, who was, you know, we used to have when we had the National Sports Acupuncture Association, our first you know, professional organization in the 90s, you know, the, we didn't have websites, we didn't have email, you know, we would write an article and mail it to each other, you know, it was, uh, it was primitive uh, by today's standards. And so the, uh, um, what am I talking about? The Iliad, oh, uh, uh, and so I saw Frank Chung. Frank Chung, Dr. Chung was very important in helping us understand the shoe stream point combination that I, that I mentioned, you know, of, of the distal shoe stream point on the affected side crossed with the same six divin meridian on the opposite side, upper, lower, right, left. And so, um, uh, and so I was talking with him and he said, what is the most important point that, that you treat? Ask me. And I said, well, if you had to put me in a corner, if I had to answer that question, I would say Jian Kwa, the needle going into the muscle belly of the gluteus medius. It is the single most important point. If that's the only point I could ever use for every patient until I retire, it would be that. I said, well, what about you? And in his Chinese um, teacher role, because he was always a teacher to us, you know, to some degree, uh, he uh, hesitated and he said, gallbladder 31. He says, it's my favorite. It's, I use it all the time. And again, he was releasing the iliotibial band. Now, we're talking about the iliotibial band as, as, as this thing, right? But remember, back at the beginning, the iliotibial band and the gluteus medius was all about pelvic stability and, and stabilizing the lumbos, lumbosacral spine and the vertebral column and, and the hip joint. So hugely important, the gluteus medius and the IT band for vast portions of, of health for the body. Um, we're just talking about the IT band. It's not just the IT band. But it was interesting. That was his point, which was essentially gallbladder 31, if needled the same, is probably the same as the extraordinary point, Gian Kuo, you know, it, with skill two different people could accomplish the same thing of activating the glute meat. But anyway, I'm talking, you don't need me to talk. So here uh, uh, I'm doing what's really, really important. I'm using light touch. Remember that gallbladder 31 exists. It exists in a depression. And if you go in there and go, oh, which one of these points hurt and you push, You've now created these depressions and all of them hurt, but one of them will hurt more, but you've now disrupted the whole transmission, the whole way this muscle presents itself. If you go very, very carefully and feel, you will feel a depression and with light touch. So always start with, don't push hard. Always start with light touch, maybe even from the inferior going up. Find the, the find the depression, and it was very clear there. I marked it. I want to check it to see how uh, how this panned out. And remember, it's seven sun up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Pretty accurate. Pretty close. That was good enough for me. But as I palpated this a little bit more, very often you could see when I needled the gluteus medius. You could see how uh, I liked two needles into, into the tissue. And in, when the tissue presents with two zones, I use it. And as I palpated this uh, model's um, IT band, I actually found a second one. And I wasn't really sure which one was gallbladder 31 and which one was not gallbladder 31. Or were they both gallbladder 31? Because... Remember, gallbladder 32 is further inferior. So uh, in my charts, I will see this every now and then, and I'll call it gallbladder 31 times two. So I found two points. Uh, uh, I found two points in the region of gallbladder 31. Very often, there's a single point. 
it stands out very, very clearly, and you got to use it. And so in this case, I've got two needles uh, pl placed, and now I insert through the iliotibial tract and make sure it's fully embedded in there. And I would pro, darn it, come back, come back. Let's, let's make sure we get a view of that, that end of soon. Um, um, I'm sorry about that. Let's go to about here. Um, ah, ah, ah. Excuse me, excuse me. So in this, in this case, you can see two perpendicular needles. If I went deep enough, these were 20 by 40. Uh, and I could still probably hit the, the, the big bone of the leg, the, the femur, uh, if I went deep enough. Uh, but usually that is more deep than I want to go. But there is an example of two needles at gold light of 31. Sometimes it's just a single point. So let's get back to the beginning. Um, so that gives us, so that gives us, uh, uh, that gives us a muscle belly to treat. It gives us a bursa to consider. It gives us the iliotibial tract to consider a needle in. It gives us the iliotibial band to thread to the undersurface. And then it gives us distal points to, from Goldblatt 34 down to the Jingwell point. So we have a lot to work with, and it's really all Xiaoyang. Uh, very often with the patient in lateral recumbent, I'll treat that, and then I'll go to the opposite side, the downside, and I'll need a liver three. So I'll put in liver three, maybe spleen six in liver three, nourish the yin of the liver for a loud screaming gallbladder that, that, that's, that needs some settling down. So let me do this. I've never really done a grading system, but here's my trip. Okay. When someone has a tight iliotibial band, stretching the iliotibial band, iliotibial tract is not very good. In my experience, I look at people who stretch the iliotibial band. It's very hard to do. And people who stretch the iliotibial tract always keep stretching the iliotibial tract because it, it never heals it. Worse is foam roller along the iliotibial tract. I give it a grade C, maybe even a D plus. Yeah, it makes the patient feel a little better. You know, the classic image of the yogi the, with the yoga mat and a foam roller and they're rolling the IT track. But you know what? Do you ever, have you ever seen that yogi Throw away the iliotibial, uh, the, the, the foam roller, the iliotibial band didn't need it anymore because she fixed it. I never saw it fixed. So if it doesn't fix it, then let's try to come up with a different strategy. So I am not of the stretching and I am not of the foam roller. Uh, I do love home treatment to the origin of the IT band at the gluteus medius, the extraordinary point Jan Qua use a tennis ball and either up against the wall or I'd lie on the floor, roll around on a tennis ball so that tennis ball will soften up all of the fascia. You remember the pictures of the medius, maximus, the TFL, and all of that fascist. It just roll around in there, soften it up. It works wonderfully. Uh, it's my absolute favorite home uh, treatment for the patient to do for themselves. Throw away the foam roller. Um, then, though, we also have a problem because the gluteus medius is inactivated. It's inhibit is is it is inhibited, and we need to activate it. So you need to do some sort of exercise. Now the the Gluteus medius is an AB doctor. If you're lying on your side, it lifts the leg to the side. If you're standing up, it lifts the leg to the side. So anything that is side, um, that's lateral abduction or side lifting, side, you know, uh, abduction to the side, uh, any of that is activating the, the, the gluteus medius. Um, 
the old school were clams, you know, they're very uh, safe. You don't get hurt, but they also aren't the highest end. But you also don't want to start by doing single leg lunges where you can really get in trouble with back and all kinds of other ways we're not doing it right. So um, clams are a very reasonable start or just have the patient stand up and and just do their leg to the side. Just even that kind of movement will remind the muscle to turn on. You've got to do some activation exercises for the gluteus medius. One simple thing is get a, 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 a physical therapy band around the thighs and have the patient do clams by uh, with resistance with that band around the, the thighs. So they're so there's resistance on this movement. This is something you got to look up. Many of you all, of course, do yoga and do exercise, and you know very there's very high-end stuff to be doing. There's also very low-end stuff, very low IQ stuff that works very, very well. So you don't have to be an exercise physiologist to do a reasonable job with um, manual therapy, yeah, we're going to leave that alone. Sliding cup along the iliotibial tract, we'll leave that alone. Stop sitting. Hey, how about that? Right here, I am here, I am on a standing desk. I'm on a stool right now, but if this was a two-hour webinar, I would start bringing this up, and I'm bring it up, I'm still sitting. So you can see here, you know, whatever, I'll bring it back down. A standing desk allows you to change positions. Very important. I always have a, 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 a movable desk where I can sit in a chair, I can sit at a stool, I can stand to do my work. Stop sitting. Uh, and also stop making plans and strategies. Remember the story of the prosecuting attorney and just about how many people you have in the financial world that are making financial plans or uh, preparing documents for a company to, to, to go public or what have you. But strategic planning is just such a part of this world now, you know. And of course, so much of that just got abruptly just ended by COVID. And all of a sudden, we're sitting around just kind of watching stand-up comedy on Netflix, you know? And so, at any rate, that's what I'm doing. I'm walking and I'm watching stand-up comedy. I will not watch anything if it doesn't make me laugh. So that's how I'm coping. So I want to, um, I really want to answer questions because there's got to be a question. But look at these illustrations here. Up top, this was using a foam roller along the lateral gallbladder channel and rolling along the iliotibial band. She will do that until the cows come home more. This woman on the bottom is smart. She's got a tennis ball, a simple tennis ball. She probably got it for free, but somebody hit it over the fence. She's just rolling around. Uh, with that ball in the iliac fossa. And as long as she doesn't roll it on the greater trochanter and flare up that bursa, you don't want to flare up the bursa. Keep it in the soft, squishy stuff. Roll it all around, up and down, side by side, with the fiber, cross fiber. This will free her from having to do anything ongoing. So um, so that's my favorite. And we're... Um, um, Oh, I want to let you all know that I have adjusted my life to just as you have adjusted your lives. Uh, I am doing live stream courses that I sponsor. I've done live stream courses with Net of Knowledge also, but I do have a few things that I, I, have, I sponsor myself. I have in June, two days on the lower extremity, you know, plantar fasciitis, uh, Achilles tendonitis, shin splints, what have you. And what I just did uh, was create six three-hour modules. I thought, you know, people are going to be bored, but they don't want to spend two days. You know, they're already sitting around and what have you. So, so here, uh, 
we've got a number of three-hour modules. All of this is on my website. I believe it might even be in some of the information that uh, that uh, Jeffrey will send out to you when we're done. But do uh, do pay attention to that if that's of any interest to you. And um, and that's it. So I, I I don't have a whole bunch else to say. But um, Jeffrey, we have some questions. I suspect. We do. Um, a good a good thing is, is that five or some of them are on the same topic. So I'm just going to ask you it in one lump question. Good. Um, so a lot of questions about eSTEM. Uh, so people would like to know your preferred settings, um, how long you would leave the eSTEM running, and if there's a device that you prefer. Okay. From Lhasa OMS, I have an eSTEM 2 machine. I like this machine because I can stick it in a pack and it doesn't break. A Pantheon, you look at it wrong and it breaks. This is very reasonably priced. A Pantheon is very expensive. So this travels well. And for so many years, I would go with athletes to races and what have you. But my a point of view on... So first of all, there is no right machine. So... ESTEM 2, and there's an ESTEM 3 now that has some things that are uh, I like even better, some of it. So I don't have that here, but I've got one right over there. Both of them um, uh, graciously given to me uh, by uh, um, LASA OMS to, 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 to use and to test, and they're wonderful. So um, I like millicurrent. Actually, let me back up. I don't think anybody has the answer for electrical stimulation. Anybody who tells you that they know how to do it and when to do it and how often to do it and at what frequencies, I do not believe it. And anybody who's telling you they're targeting um, um, uh, opiate receptors, it's like, that's not what we're doing. We're targeting fascia. We're targeting bursa. We're targeting a muscle belly. We're not targeting opiate receptors. If we could target opiate receptors and block pain, we we you know, we'd live on I we'd own islands and you know, work, you know, uh, two days a week and lie around and swim and snorkel and what have you. You know, it I don't know any acupuncture can stop pain. It just it's not that simple. You got to find out why there's pain and fix the pain generating um, tissues. Now, in the case of talking today, the gluteus medius and minimus are huge pain generating uh, um, tissues. And you saw those red dots earlier of all the referral zones that that can go to. That's just two muscles, one little area creating pain throughout the lumbosacral pelvic region. So the um, so again, I don't have the answer. So I can only tell you what I know. Uh, and I would be I am suspicious of what anybody else says if they are definite that this is the only way to do it. I think any way that you've been taught probably will work uh, will work great for you, right? So I use millicurrent, not microcurrent. I like a continuous wave, not a dense disperse or a discontinuous wave or what have you. I just like a continuous wave somewhere around 10 hertz, right? On a Pantheon, you could get 10 hertz, you know, 5 to 10 to 12, somewhere in that range, under, under 15 hertz, definitely, maybe even a 10 or under, just like this really peaceful tapping of that continuous wave. And I just turn it up to patient uh, tolerance. So, um, so that is my um, theory on, on, that's what I do with uh, eSTEM. And if I am going to a muscle like the gluteus medius, that's, that's inhibited, it's weak. Now I, we didn't really mention this, but one of the things we do is we manual muscle test. And I just talked about palpating the zone, but you do resisted abduction and that muscle is weak, then, then that clearly shows us that the muscle is inhibited. So you do want a manual muscle test gluteus medius. So if you have a, 
if you have a if you have an inhibited muscle, this happens throughout the body, supraspinatus and other places. I'm really happy with with needling uh, for just up five to ten minutes with e stim and not doing too much. Okay. Uh, when I'm trying to profuse a tissue with current for the for the for, to profuse chi and blood into the tissue, I will usually use uh, uh, anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. So I prolong the the, the time when there's when there's um, heat and inflammation and and we're trying to get chi and blood moving in an area where there's trauma. But in an area where the muscle has just been inhibited, I don't think you need to go quite that long at intense. So, uh, so that's the question to there. And um, so, use what you're what you're already what you already know, and just have faith that cr uh, electric current once it gets in the body, it's all going to act very similarly to move chi and blood and to activate muscles. However, if you don't know, if you don't have anything good. Do, do what I suggested. You know, it would be one more variable you don't have to think about. You just do it the same way and try it for five or 10 years and see how it works for you. Next one. All right. Thank you so much. Um, next question is, is the usher at Gen Qua typically deep at the muscle layer or can it be super fit? The, 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 it's a good question. As you palpate into Gen Qua, you do not have to push deep, deep, deep all the way down to almost to the bone. So, but it's not superficial. So it's it, it's an intermediate depth. Remember, you've got the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus and bone, you know, in the fossa. So I would say it's at about an intermediate depth that you will get the asher, but the asher will be very clear. But if you're palpating too light, sometimes you'll miss it. So go a little, little deeper. The trick is once you've found that, then you use a three inch needle and then, and then you can find the depth by just, you just keep going through. And when you hit the bone, then you've gone all the way through those two muscles and that's too deep. So, um, so generally speaking, though, the gluteus medius will be easier to, to traverse with the needle. The gluteus minimus is going to be a little denser of a muscle. And so you'll feel more resistance as the needle passes in as it gets a little deeper. So that sort of answers your question. All right. Uh, next question. Some patients experience pain in the lateral fibula of the knee joint when the IT band is tight. Does this needling leave the pain to the gluteus and also to other joints? Uh, sometimes, uh, I don't think I can answer that question well without too many, uh, with my, uh, I would need to talk. Why don't you, why don't you email me that question? I need more information to see what you're getting at. So I'm not sure right. what you're getting at. Okay, I'm sorry, but I'm happy to answer it if you yeah. if you write it. Do not be sorry at all. So Sanu, please I'd like to get um, a better answer to your question. Just email Wit, and he will get that for you. Okay. Um, next question: I don't use Eastim. Will retention alone help? And if so, how long? Um. Oh boy. If you, uh, there's a there's a number of things going on here, so let's just take the gluteus medius. Uh, we, when you needle through the gluteus medius, it's fairly easy to activate that muscle with a needle, with without e stem, and then as you get deeper into the gluteus minimus, that muscle is thicker and denser, but sometimes there's fascia, uh, kind of almost like a fibrosis, uh, or, or let's just say that there's been a muscle tear and that muscle tear has fibrosis. That needle then will sometimes needle through the fibrotic scar tissue of the muscle, open that tissue up so that blood can then get into the muscle and heal. 
So a needle without e-stem is very good at activating a muscle that's inhibited and it's very good at mechanically breaking up fascial and fibrotic scar tissue in areas of, in, uh, that surround muscles that, like some of the neck muscles. You just feel crepitus when you roll over the levator. It's like the covering of the levator is like plastic almost. It's, it's so thick and that needle through there is, is uh, uh, the, it will mechanically open that up. However, uh, electric current in, uh, in some of the more complex cases as like when you have tendinosis, you have a tendon that's really thickened and degenerated and lots of scar tissue. You know, the needle's okay and it mechanically does its job of trying to open up that tissue. But uh, E-STEM, I, I just don't, uh, it's just such a valuable tool that we can use that I just really recommend that you try to figure out how to make that work for you because your treatments will get so much better with, with E-STEM, so. All right, moving along. Uh, next question, for the bursitis treatment, does it ever flare after bursite or so sensitive? The, 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 the trochanteric burst, because there's not, there's just not a lot of covering over that. So when you, you might needle it, it might flare up a little bit. There's nothing it's flaring up against. Like if you were to needle something, the tendon, the supraspinatus tendon under the bone here or something under the patella. Sometimes something flares up and it doesn't, there's not room for it to flare up. Uh, sometimes it'll get, um, uh, it, it'll aggravate. The, the, the greater trochanter bursa, it rarely aggravates. So uh, if you're careful, I mean, if you're using a big fat carbo with hooks on it and you're jabbing all around, <laughs> there, it's, it, it, there's going to be regional trauma that that might be clinically useful i, I wouldn't do that but but um but it, it it could be clinically useful uh, if you're using these these leaner needles like 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 here's one of my real favorite needles is a 20 uh by 50 sarin needle you know when we need two inch needle to really thread into places but this needle you know the the quality of the shaft of the needle and they just move through tissue so well and and so uh i don't even know what i'm talking about but um lean needles can, can you can do a lot with lean needles so and and, and high-end needles I, I just think you need to make sure your tools are really good tools all right. Uh, next question. Do you ever thread the IT more proximally or proximally? Proxim or is it yeah. proximally? Sorry. Or is it most often near the knee? Uh, I, I, yeah, no, I don't needle it. There, there could be reasons for you to uh, needle it more proximally. But um, so, but here, the reason why we needle here, keep that in, in mind is that look here on the left side you can see that under the red the area of pain is red you can see that the bone is 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 there and that bone you know uh, comes out and so it's rubbing across the bone as you go more proximal there's not an epicondyle and, and the shaft of the femur is you know two or three inches deep to the iliotibial band. So there would be no reason to thread under the iliotibial band uh, more proximally if your target was the undersurface of the iliotibial band that had been frictioning or rubbing on the lateral epicondyle of the knee. However, there's all kinds of reasons that you might want to be needling around here, uh, say mid tendon around gallbladder 31, front and back and under, if the tightness was also part of the vastus lateralis. Now, uh, so that makes me um, um, that makes me then bring us back here that uh, number f uh, under Fischel, yeah, well, uh, um, uh, well, hold on. Let me go one more. Uh, 
Number five, manual therapy or roller therapy to the vastus lateralis. That's the stomach meridian. So that, that would be in front of the iliotibial band. It's on the lateral quadriceps in the region of stomach 32. So sometimes the stomach channel and, the, and, and, and a different tissue, the vastus lateralis of the quadriceps are also tight and that is contributing to the tightness of the iliotibial band. So I'll often needle stomach 32. I didn't mention this because I couldn't mention everything. Hour. Uh, and uh, so that could be part of your target of, of needling under the iliotibial band more proximally. So that's a, that it, it depends on what your target is. If that's your target, then that could work. Okay. All right. Um, have you utilized this treatment successfully with folks uh, who've had total hip replacements? Um, no, I have not. I. Um, no, I haven't used it unsuccessfully. I have tended to uh, to not be treating a lot of hip replacements. Uh, so I'm having other people do it. I mean, the reality is, is that I left Boulder, Colorado in 2013. And I went to Maui, uh, to Hawaii for a self-induced sabbatical for three, three or so years. And uh, I didn't practice. I only taught for those three years over there. Um, and so I just, I, you know, this was when you would really start seeing all the hip and knee replacements and how they're doing. And, you know, because I need 10 years to figure something out. You know, I, I can't figure it out in a day or a week or a month. So, so I don't have an answer to that that I have clinically uh, tried and tr tried and true. Uh, I suspect if it was a hip replacement, not a knee replacement, I suspect that would uh could be very interesting and effective. And if you find that, please email me and tell me. I would like to know. I'm still gathering data on that one. All right. Um, would you do the same type of treatment used for bursitis if the patient has a labral tear, surgically repaired but still in full, that is surround the dragon and Easton? Uh, I would only use that the bursa treatment i would only use it for the bursa so if the if the labral patient happens to have a an inflamed bursa then i would use it for the inflamed bursa but i, I would have no effect to my knowledge I, I see no reason why it would have any effect uh on the on the uh labral tear in the in the hip joint so i wouldn't use it for the labral tear but the labral tear and compensation after surgery could result in the hip bursa being inflamed, then I would use it. All right, and what do you use to draw blood? What do I use to draw blood? I love drawing blood, I didn't mention that. <laughs> so uh, I draw blood in a, in, a, in a kinder, gentler fashion by bleeding the Jingwell points, and I just use a lancet. I, I go to CVS and buy a you know, medium-sized lancet, and sometimes I get a big one, and sometimes I get the small one if I forget my glasses. So I just use whatever I have. And, and I, I play the bass, and in the bass you have a, uh, like an a eighth, eighth note or a sixteenth note before the first beat that goes ba-bum, dum-dum-dum, ba-bum, dum. And so... I get that rhythm and it's da dum 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 ba bum, right? So it's a quick in and a long out. Boom. And it's just this rhythm that that you do and you never hurt the patient. The opposite of that would be dun 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 dun. Yeah, it's not a hard in, right? It's a quick in. Ba -bum. So uh, I use a lancet. And then all other um, bleeding I use would be 20 to 30 lancet holes like, uh, what are we doing? What have we just talked about? Let's just go up here because you can see it. Uh, if we have a problem with the rotator cuff attachments in the shoulder, I'll get a lancet, 20 to 30 lancet holes over this region of LI15, Sanjal 14, and I'll put on a cup and do a bleeding cup into here, and then I will follow all the guidance of proper uh, clean um, uh, needle and technique of the state or the country that 
I'm in or you are in. This is a great uh, silicone cup that um, that we're really happy about that uh, that Lasso OMS has. So sometimes you can even throw these away. I hate to think of that. But uh, you, will, I also use glass cups and the glass cups, fire cups bleeding into the cup. I'll use a little bigger one than this, but I really like uh, bleeding cups. The, those glass cups uh, um, can be properly sterilized and every state has whatever the, you know, whatever the, the, the procedures are for clean, clean needle. But if you have Ziploc bags and gloves and you just look like you're a real medical person rather than, you know, this weird look on your face with a, with a needle coming to draw blood, you know, I mean, just, if you just put on some gloves and have some paper towels and all that, you know, you can pull this off and nobody, nobody is going to flinch on bleeding the Jingwell points. Don't ask the patient bleed the Jing well point. You need to do that. It's one of the most important treatments to, to activate uh, um, the, the channels and relieve pain and move chi and blood. So very important. One more question. And I think we're all running out of time. What yes. do you got there? Well, thank you for, thank you for hanging there so long with us. Uh, let's see. Let me get a good one. Um, is pain by T band syndrome sometimes caused by bursitis near the tibial insertion, or do you treat the bursa there ever? Oh yeah, you know I was teaching a few years ago in uh, in Australia and in Sydney, and this guy got hit from the side uh, playing rugby. And then there, you know, these Australians are, you know, these are these are real guys, you know, you know. The, they would pretty much, you know, flatten me in no time, you know. So I might be able to walk longer than they could ever walk. But up against uh, brute force, man, I would be history. So um, so these guys, guy got hit and he had an inflamed bursa right. Oh, I, you can't see my cursor uh, right below the X. Uh, um and right below the joint line. Now remember, the joint line of the lateral knee is level with the inferior border of the patella. So if you draw a line from the inferior border of the patella along there, that's roughly where the joint line is. And the bursa is going to be at or maybe a little below there. And sometimes the iliotibial has an iliotibial bursitis. Uh, uh, oh, and, and, but this patient got hit so hard that this bursa just blew up and you could just see it. And it looked like uh, it, this is a this is a candle and it, and it, and it, and it just looked like uh, this circular, you know, plastic device, you know, that was just in his just embedded in his leg. And it was all fibrotic, uh, scar tissue. And the thickened of the bursa. I mean, it was really bad, you know. So the whole iliotibial band was a mess. So we had to go all the way above, all the way below. But you'd have to needle in and really soften that that that. You'd have to mechanically strike that tissue numerous times. Uh, um, I see my email on there. That's not my email. That's not my email. Oops. My email is wreevesoffice at gmail.com. That'll go, that'll get into a private account that I never look at. So wreevesoffice. There you go. There we go. I, I, I haven't looked at this thing. So if any of you all have, have said nice things or hellos to me, I can't, it's hard for me to, to, to read uh, the ongoing chat here. But listen, I thank you all very much. Lasa OMS, man, these guys are awesome. And uh, we're so thankful that we have people who understand that learning uh, is, is, is just as important as, as buying and selling of the right tools and, and herbs and what have you. These guys do a great job. I really respect uh, all of them, Mike and Jeffrey and Carl and the whole crew. So, uh, you know, clapping for the Lasa guys. Thank you so much. And I'm honored that you'd listen to me for an hour and a half out of your day. So, you know. Well, thank you, Whit. We can't yeah. thank you enough. You know, this is actually our fourth webinar together. You mm -hmm. are 
first, you were our first webinar host for our first ever. Oh, that's and right. I remember. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. looked it up. It was April 25th, 2018. So it was over two years ago. Uh -huh. um, we're so grateful to you. We're so grateful for everyone who shared this tonight. Um, if you have any questions for Wit, uh, email wreavesoffice at gmail.com. You can also go to whitfieldreeves.com and you can check out all of his upcoming seminars and webinars and any anything else that you can learn from Wit. Um, our next webinar is actually going to be from Wit's former students, which is Chad Bong on Thursday night at oh, 7 yeah. p.m. And it will be highly responsive. Um, injuries and it will be shoulder edition. So look forward to that. I uh, will be emailing registration out shortly and everybody have a wonderful evening. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks guys. Thanks, Wet. Thank you. Thank you.